Yeah. Oh, yeah. What's up, everybody? This is Dominic yeah. D'Angelo, and I am here with one of a kind with RVD, and guess who's here? I mean, yes, guys, who's guess who's here? <laughs> it's RVD. Rob, how are you, man? How about that, man? Excellent. Excellent, dude. Happy this week to you. Happy this week to you, too. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> the Ides of March returning, I guess. Um, um, that's quite the shindig going on happening, huh? Yeah, yeah, man. I had uh, three girls dancing to uh, a little higher. Yeah. A second ago, you missed it. Uh, thanks again to Seth from Venice Beach Digital Community, or whatever the fuck that stands for. <laughs> Close, I think. Oh, no, well, it is. Venice Beach Dub Club. Yeah, Dub Club. That's it. That's it. Duh. I only looked at the four letters and... and didn't think about looking past that. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, awesome. I had, you know, I read the comments and my YouTube page from the uh, readers. I had some one time somebody said, um, Rob needs to find another place to do his podcast. He's like, um, too much movement going on in the background. <laughs> I thought that was funny because I think it adds to it. It know? does. I like it too. It's a neat element, I think. You know, stuff's going on. Stuff is happening. Um, stuff is definitely happening, Rob. Guys, I mean, we're live. It's making out behind me. And <laughs> See, you can't go wrong. Mm -hmm. But we're live, guys. If you want to chime in and uh, definitely get a question asked, use the super chat. Uh, feel free to promote anything or ask Rob a question. You know, we got a lot of stuff, fun stuff to cover. We'll keep it nice and tight today. Um, but what we got, uh, what we got to start off, I think, with is the a little bit of the conversation that happened this week with WWE and. Uh, Somebody you know very well, Mr. Paul Heyman, getting inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame coming up. Uh, Philadelphia, it's appropriate. Um, what a name. I mean, it's kind of long, long time deserving. It always seemed like Paul, did, from how it seemed, it didn't want Paul didn't want to do it while he was an active participant on air and stuff like that from the reports I've heard. But, Rob, what do you think of this happening for Paul? Um, I think it's really cool. I think that, you know, it's uh, giving him his well-deserved flowers. I worked with Paul, obviously, in ECW, so I have that perspective of him with his hands-on skills of building superstars, helping uh, talent find their way and connect with their skills and maybe even definitely even exposing some of their weaknesses so they know about it. And he's just always been that guy that obviously we can all say ECW wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for him. The whole effing show wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for Paul. But um, when he, when I was in WWE with Paul too, I really got a kick out of seeing the WWE wrestlers giving Paul the same respect that uh, that we did in ECW and you know on the outside especially knowing the bigger picture like I know now all the wrestlers and all the companies grew up watching us anyway so of course they respect us but didn't feel like that when I was there in the boots when so and so was wanting to give me a running power bomb into the corner and uh, <laughs> and they and, uh, and, and you know just talking to me like um, more like I'm his nameless opponent for the night is what it felt like a lot of times mm -hmm. to see certain talent um pull paul aside you don't know, ask for his advice and for him to be giving it and take certain wrestlers under his wing i i thought that was awesome because um i mean obviously wwe is a much bigger pond and to see him getting the respect uh and see it working there and seeing his effect on the much bigger show i I've always enjoyed that. That's always been real enjoyable for me. So to see him in a position now where his decisions, I don't even know how much of the show um, he's controlling, but I know that he has a lot to do with uh, creative uh, uh, um, choices that are made and, and to see him get credit for that. And on top of that, being a, in a top position in the uh, production like he is man it's it's uh it's really awesome and, and i was thinking of maybe not going to the hall of fame this year and once i found this out now i'm thinking i probably will go yeah yeah um you, yeah i mean a big talk about like as always when somebody gets announced they're like whoa who's gonna induct him who could it be you know right. like, you know uh there's been some names out there obviously i've been making the play for you like why you would be a good uh, reason, person to induct him, obviously. And then there's other names like Steve Austin. People mentioned CM Punk's another one. 
Um, Tommy Dreamer is another one maybe out there too. Well, how, how do you feel about that? Uh, you know, uh, who do you think should induct Paul and uh, what, what, what do you think on that level? I, I think they can definitely find somebody better than me. You know, it'd be an honor if, and of course, if I was uh, nominated and, and asked to do it, I would give it my best. And I think that I would want input from other wrestlers too, that I think, should have got picked probably over me. I mean, Dreamer, Bubba, Taz, those guys, they know Paul a lot more than I do. They were in New York. I would see him on the weekends. They'd see him all week too. And they were there in the office in the production uh, studio, helping move the TV forward. Uh, 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 also with the merchandise and just booking towns, everything. They really worked with them. Um, and, and so there's that. And then even before ECW, you know, he managed a lot of wrestlers and uh, some of them could probably tell some good stories about Paul transitioning from being the the fan that was selling programs to the camera guy to, uh, you know, actually managing talent or however, might have, if that if that pathway is flawed, then um, excuse me, but it was something like that. And I know we were, uh, you know, the Samoans, I don't know if they speak English uh, that well, but uh, um, there's definitely some other, uh, I mean, I don't know, uh, franchise, Shane Douglas, I'll put him on my list. And I don't know what their relationship is, but um, that's that's how I feel about it. You know, I'd be honored. Of course, I would do it. I would want input from everyone else. And, and I feel like I only knew one, maybe two sides of Paul. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's cool, though, like just knowing how you handle yourself on the podcast here and the way you kind of deliver stuff, whether it's our ideology or something like that. It's like I know even off the cuff, off the top of your head, I'm sure you could give something like that's really good for Paul and like really conveys who he is as what he did for you and what he did for others, too. And You know, so it, it's going to be interesting. There's a lot of good names that I think could do it. And Paul's influenced so many people. You just even look at it now, like him being with Roman Reigns and the bloodline and stuff like that. It's like. Big name after yeah. big name and stuff. Yeah, I wonder if maybe they'll go with someone along those lines to induct him because it would be more consistent with the bullet points that they're that they're trying to make that week with business and with mania and um, you know if not if not one of the young bloodlines that he's managing maybe someone in their family I don't know um, I I could see them going with like that which could be a current angle, but it's where they're at right now also yeah. as opposed to, but I don't know. I just found out there's no categories. I, I thought like I, I, I had heard they were going to do like an extreme wing or something. And then I was talking to, I think Bill after the other day and I was saying, what, what, what is the category that Paul's in? He's like, no category. He's just like you. I said, Really? Yeah. Like, what about like um, Pete Rose? Doesn't he have like a special celebrity? A celebrity wing. They do have a celebrity wing. Oh, they do. Yeah. There is a celebrity wing, so people now I'm more confused than ever. Thought yeah. I understood it, and you just threw that at me. Well, okay, so I think that's the only. Well, no, not technically too, because I do. Because think a there's a warrior. There's a warrior wing. There's a warrior award, so somebody like, uh, like a Shad Gaspard or something would win the warrior award, who won it, I believe, two years ago, maybe. But like somebody that's done a lot, you know, or like overcomes right. something, and then um, there is the the celebrity wing. So you, I think, there's names like Donald Trump. Drew Carey, um, Pete Rose, uh, Mike Tyson, I believe, is in that wing. Uh, Snoop Dogg, I think, too. There's some others. Um, and, 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 but so my understanding now is that wrestlers or – I mean, I don't know. He's, what's he getting in for? Is it for being a manager or for being a, a, a booker or – I think it's all around. Okay. All around. Because, like, there is – there's the, just the – you're, like – structured hall of fame like so you're in there you know like bruno's in there you know name everybody steve austin whoever you know and paul is going to be a part of that now there's also a legacy one which is people that weren't necessarily involved with WWE, but still had like a bigger impact in the business like in, a, in an earlier time so like luthez or a frank gotch or bobo brazil yeah there's there's that an underlying wing basically how about it. how about like greg Gagne, um his dad Bern, uh, I, th Bern, I think is in your hall of fame so he's a okay. part of your guys i think mm, interesting yeah so i don't know how they distinguish it between one another like bruiser brody's in the other one you know in the in the other wing the legacy wing. and when i introduce the sheik maybe he's in the legacy one he might be in the legacy one i'll have to double check on that one because hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so 
So, but yeah, there's a core one that all the names, you know, when they have their induction speeches or like they have a moment for them, that that's the one Paul is going to be in along with you and, you know, other. Cool. cool. Well, it's great to see him get his flowers and, and what an important man behind the scenes he is. Yeah, 100 percent. Jeez, all this. You hear everybody talk about him in certain ways and what he's done for them. And, you know, even you just mentioned it, too, like the people that, you know, the younger talent that that kind of goes to him. And like, I'm sure he's very proactive backstage and like kind of giving people input and stuff. Of course. Yeah, yeah definitely. Congrats to Paul Lee. Another uh, name that's rumored, not announced. And I just kind of wanted to get your if you had any good stories. We might have talked about him before on here, but Haku's another name like that's been thrown around um, for for the Hall of Fame, and uh, he's very deserving. One of the legit toughest guys in the business. You always hear. Uh, you have any good Haku stories, Rob? Mm, you know, I, I, I all of my encounters with Haku have been very good, but I don't have any interesting stories. Last time I remember seeing him was at the um, Cauliflower Alley Club uh, mm -hmm. earlier. Um, I don't even know if that was this year or last year, because it's usually in April, but that's coming up. Uh, anyway, um, several months ago, you know, whenever I see him, he's always, he's, he's one of those guys, he's just always been, uh, made me feel like he really appreciated me and seeing me and always happy, big hug. And, um, and, and so I've always, look forward to that when I see him and I've always respected the hell out of him because of his reputation, you know, knowing that that dude, uh, you know, doesn't mind taking out five or six guys in a bar. Um, the, the short way, not with high spots, getting, <laughs> right, getting, getting right to it. You know, that's, uh, we all respect, I think the guys in the business that, that, that are, that are tougher and, and don't have to, uh, uh, pretend and are more, more genuine, you know? So, um, that growing up, he, you know, uh, he was awesome. He was King Tonga and, uh, and the Tonga kid, they were a tag team. I remember reading in WWF magazine, the Tonga kid carried around a trampoline, a little portable trampoline with him, and that he would practice jumping on it in the dressing room. And that's how he got so high for his top rope splash <laughs> that he would use. Oh. I remember believing that as a little kid, you know, wow, that's so cool. And, and then I ended up doing a uh, pretty high uh, top rope splash as well. But um, that's, uh, that's you know, I don't have any any stories or any like one-on-one -on -one experiences or anything like that. Yeah. 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 It's like, yeah. I, I got to meet him actually. Uh, when was it? I was when I was in Tampa. He was there for like a top guy thing for ad free shows and he was back back there hanging out uh, i got to introduce so it was pretty cool very nice dude super nice yeah. do you yeah. ever see that do you have you seen the clip that's floating around of him on dark side of the ring watching the shock master like, i just saw that last night yeah it, yeah it was like man it's so it's so good to see such a genuine belly laugh yeah. out of him <laughs> uh, yeah i was just we were all watching that last night and i was like oh, i can't believe they're showing this dude trip on the documentary, like of his dark side, like that thing is living with him forever. Instead of just one spot, he screwed up. Like, man, that poor guy. And then Haku, like he just kept laughing and laughing so hard, you know, had me laughing. And then pretty soon it was, it was hey, it was funny. You know? <laughs> but, yeah, so genuine. And he's, you could tell he'd never seen that before. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty funny stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another name that did get announced too is a uh, Bull Nakano. Uh, do you have any cross? Did you cross paths with her ever? Never. I didn't think so, but yeah, she. Um, I know she made a big kind of wave there with in WWE in the early '90s, where she'd fight Medusa one on one, and that's kind of where her she got mainstream play, and then okay. obviously in Japan a little bit, and then she went into pro golfing apparently too. So, um, hmm. but yeah, what, kind of she was, was she with all Japan women? Yes, I believe so. I that's know she got her start there. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. So. Pretty cool, pretty cool there. It's got, I'm intrigued to see who else. I'm crossing my fingers for Sabu. That's my number one, I'm hoping. Yeah, sure it would be cool. And uh, how many do they induct anyways? I think it's like six or seven. Okay. Uh, somebody in the chat might know. It's about six And, we, and we're, we're, we're hearing talk of three at this point? Okay. Yes, yeah, so Paul's confirmed. Bull yeah. is confirmed. And the rumor is Haku at the moment. So oh, okay. Those are the only ones kind of set up for now. So it'll be interesting to see w w how it all lays out, especially for a place like Philly, you know. 
man, the reception that Paul's going to get there, <laughs> it's going to yeah. be really good. Yeah, those fans are going to be loud and boisterous and very – they're, they're going to be very proud. Mm -hmm. You know, that's going to be heartfelt from all the fans in Philly. They're going to feel like we did this, cool. yeah. you know, because it's their support, their love, their – their energy that allowed ECW to thrive the way it did and to hit everyone across the world. And, uh, and they're going to take note of that. They're going to feel it for sure. No doubt. Philly's going to be rocking that week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what, what arena? Um, do you know what arena the Hall of Fame is in? Oh, I think it'll be at the Wells Fargo Center. Wells Fargo. So, yeah, where the Sixers play and stuff. I think so, it used to be the first union, right? I think so. I knew it was uh, it was called something else too. Dang it! What was it? The Wachovia Center. I know it was. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Okay, Wachovia yeah. Center. But uh, yeah, so it'll it'll be there. I don't know how they do it now. I think it's they do it on SmackDown, like after SmackDown or something. They they like coincide both of them together. Or something. Yeah. So on, on on Friday. Yeah, I think it might happen on Friday. I'm not super yeah. positive about that. Though. Yeah. Well, right now I don't know if we talked about it, but right now for me. I'm looking at a pretty busy uh, week between uh, signing for the three days at WrestleCon. Um, I have a watch along Sunday evening somewhere for uh, Mania. I have an appearance at uh, Indigo Dispensary in New Jersey. I have a match at the uh, ECW Arena with uh, Mike Speedball Bailey. Very impressive match. Um, and, uh, there's a couple other things too. And there's some things that aren't settled yet too. Maybe or maybe not with busted open radio and celebrity boxing and, uh, trying to fit in what we can, but it's a great week. If anyone's thinking about going to Philly for the WrestleMania week, even if you you don't even go to WrestleMania, there's just so many activities going on. So many different shows. Uh, I don't know specifically about Philly, but, um, in, in another town recently, I heard there was like 37 different wrestling shows, um, in the few days leading up to, uh, to WrestleMania and they're all at different buildings. Some buildings will have four different shows during the day. And, um, it's, it's really cool. And of course at the WrestleCon, you can meet all the, the wrestlers that are, that are scheduled to be there. Um, also there's the hall of fame and, um, yeah. Like I said, there's a few other things, too, that are floating in the air. I'll be pretty busy. You'll be there, yeah. right? I'll be there. I'll, I'm going to be there all the week, the whole week. I think I'm going to arrive there April 1st and just hang. Like, Philly's my old stopping grounds where I lived. So I'll okay. be up with some buddies and stuff like that and kind of making the experience and kind of just hoping to get some interviews, get some good content going and stuff like that and see what happens. But, yeah, definitely, guys, go see Rob. Uh, if you see me, I'll, I'll be more than happy to say hi to you and interact with every, everything like that. It's going to be a fun week, Rob. I'm pretty excited. Yeah, mm -hmm. lots of stuff before then too, and and we'll get to that as well. Absolutely, absolutely. Seth, our first to chime in with the super chat, nine ninety nine. Thanks, brother. He said, "Rob, where'd you get the inspiration to shave the back of your head? I've been doing the same since the first time I saw you rocking it in ninety seven. It wasn't common back then. Maybe just shallow and monks." He says. <laughs> so where'd you get the inspiration to do that, Rob? Damn it. It's another one of those questions that I'm not really sure I can provide an answer. Um, what's your PayPal, dude? I owe you $9.99. <laughs> there you go. Um, I don't, I mean, it was just, um, you know, a lot of leftover growth. And uh, at a certain point, some of the hair on the back of my neck wasn't long enough to, to reach into the ponytail. So then it just was all bushy and, and scruffy looking. And so at some point, just to clean it up, I don't know whose idea it was, though. That's what I can't tell you for sure. It could have even just been a barber. It could have said, hey, you want me to just clean the back of your neck up for you? And um, and I liked it. And, I, you know, everyone remembers I used to also shave the sides of my head for a while. Um, but what happened during that time period is that it seemed like every time I would get my hair cut, which isn't very often, right now it seems like once every – six or seven months maybe i go and get a little bit yeah um but what would happen is i would try and get it cleaned up before doing a tv or, or whatever so it was a lot more often and, and and they would shave the sides but the the hairline kept getting higher and higher a little higher and, then, and in the back too and then like when i would see 
footage of myself, like a camera angle from the back, it started feeling like I just had the little monk, you know, round a little, like just a little round piece of hair because it was getting more and more and more like that. And I would tell the barbers like, hey, you know, clean this up, but don't raise it. I don't want it any higher. And that's why eventually I said, you know what, fuck it. It's going to look like shit for six to 12 months, but I'm going to grow the hair on my sides back in. And I remember when I did actually, um, I think Paul was one of the ones, you know, that said, you just shave your, shave your sides. And I was like, nah, nah, I, I'm sticking it out. I'm committed <laughs> and go through this. Eventually it's going to tie back and it'll be like I used to, and I'll have a head full of hair instead of just a little patch. So that's, that's the, that's the story. There we go, man. Oh. Yeah, it's a, a unique look. I remember always trying to create you on video games. If you weren't on there, it would be so tough because they didn't have your hairstyle. So interesting. Speaking of, uh, Slam Death says RVD in 2K24 is unstoppable. So you must be pretty darn good in that game, bro. Nice. Yeah. That's so cool to um, to know that that's for sure because I never know for sure. And then there's rumors, and then and then it's not being true, or whatever. Or I don't understand. Like I didn't understand. If I was on the on the game or not, when they said a variant, because it sounded to me like something outside of the game, but you explained it's not. Um, yeah. So, so that's that's super cool. Um, looking forward to uh, um, people playing that, getting feedback about that, and also today I saw a new RVD action figure that's coming. That's out. right, Rob. I was going to post that up because I was like, oh man, I kind of hope he didn't see it yet, so I could surprise him. But uh, here it is. You see that, baby. Yeah. Oh, look, look, here it is. That's the that. outfit. That's awesome. Oh, yeah, that's so cool. Dude, I love I love how you put the original outfit next to it to yeah. show that. That's yeah. great. That's, that's the really Mr. Really Monday cool. Night. That's Mr. Monday Night from uh 1997 when I um when oh, I Oh, look at it's lovey. Oh, little lovey. Oh. <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, the... <laughs> doing a run in on daddy's show. Mm. That was uh, 97 match against Jeff Hardy on uh, Raw. That's right. That's right. And, you know, it's the figure line apparently is the Monday Night Wars. So that's why they have you in there and they have yeah. – they have. Obviously, it's not the only time I wore it. In fact, I think I had that same outfit on when I wrestled Lance Storm at the pay-per-view leading up to it and did that promo where um, – you know, um, I belong on Monday nights, you know, yeah. I get, I'm worth more money here <laughs> and more I'm, RVD is worth <laughs> more money elsewhere. I think young RVD is my favorite impression yeah. of yours. <laughs> <laughs> Yet, son, you're going to get what no one's ever got before. A damn Terminator. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Trey Norton, nine ninety nine. Thank you, Trey. Scott Norton. Scott Norton. He, he's oh, it's Trey Nelson. Jeez, I. Who that guy? Away from laughing. He's okay. like, if you had a promotion, Russo, Cornette, or Bischoff, out of the three, who would you pick as your head writer? Vince Russo, Jim Cornette, or Eric Bischoff, Rob? Well, I mean, without having anything else to go by except for just this information, if I had to make a quick pick, I would go with my good friend Eric Bischoff. Eric's the man. Yeah. He's so smart-minded with the business, and uh, he, he does that show Strictly Business on ad-free shows, which is great, and, like, breaks it down, doesn't pull any BS, you know, or anything like that. He's just straightforward with it, man. Yeah, and, if yeah, he comes across in normal conversation as a very – intelligent person you know um which you know helps it doesn't isn't necess necessarily a, a uh a detriment it doesn't have to be that way in order to be a wrestling promoter but but um but from but i've always been impressed with him and always felt like he's a guy i could learn from and i always feel like he would have the answer if i have a question you know yeah, yeah. whatever the question is you know <laughs> He'd be there to help out for sure. I asked him, like, how do you get your IQ tested? Do you know? And he was like, mm, I don't know. And I was like, oh, I just I just thought you would know because I would like to do that someday. And I was just thinking about that. When I was looking at you because you're a brain. <laughs> Did you ever take an IQ test, Rob? No, and I do want to. Um, and I, you know, I've, I've I've looked it up online, and it seems like you can do lots of tests online, uh, and they get quasi-respect, you know, from the – 
IQ community, like some of them say, they, well, the ones online are, are BS, and other ones say they're like 99% accurate. I, I, I don't know. I would love to do that. Like, however, um, but, but one that's accredited so that I could show afterwards, this is what I got, you know, not just uh, 99 cents. Uh, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, not, not just on some uh, Google, uh, hey, how smart am I? But yeah, I, I want to. If anyone listening knows how, how to get yeah. that done. That's that's been on my bucket list for a long time. See, that'd be sweet. And then you could another monetary cab is Mr. IQ. Boom. I'm pretty sure I would be scoring a lot higher than some of my um I don't know if they're followers uh or <laughs> <laughs> some of my um some of the Chirpers on yes, Twitter. Some of the wrestling fans would would expect. Let me put it that way. I'm sure I'd score higher than what some of the wrestling fans would expect. Let's leave it at that. Hey, there you go. I like it. I like it. Mm -hmm. M the Don, he says his IQ would be 420. Nice. Hey, and that's pretty good, too, from what I understand. Yeah, that's pretty darn good right there. Um, all right. Uh, there was a whole lot do you think of an IQ, do you think an IQ is based on how much uh knowledge you have or how smart you are? Because those are two different things, you know. Like That's if you're really right. smart, if you're really smart and intelligent, um, uh, without any 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 um knowledge up till that point, I could put you in a situation if you're smart enough, you could figure out how to get out of it. Whereas knowledge is who is the fucking 14th president of the US. Yeah, yeah. yeah. big difference, big difference. Oh. I think it's the former Rob where it's like you can kind of formulate how to solve problems and certain things like that. I think, I think that's more, more the IQ aspect, I think, hmm. you know, I hope I, so. yeah, I'd be, I it should know. be, I think. Yeah. I don't think, I think I, you should be able to be a genius and live in the woods. I, you know I mean? As far as that goes, I don't, I don't think you should necessarily have, have to have, a photographic uh, memory um, or have been exposed to information in order to be really smart. Right. Right. I agree. I agree, man. Yeah. Now you got me intrigued. I want to almost take an IQ test. I don't think I would do very well, to be honest. Uh, I took an SAT. I took the SATs and didn't do very good on those. I know that much. I couldn't even spell SAT. <laughs> hey, um, so a lot of buzz that happened was uh, AEW revolution was this past week. And, uh, Sting had his last match. We talked about that plenty of times on here. Um, pretty good send off, it seemed. Uh, you know, he ended it on his own terms. His son showed up and stuff like that. Uh, but a big takeaway uh, from that match too was uh, Darby's big leap. Did you see the clip of him doing that by chance? Jumped off a ladder, and uh, the um, the heel um, brothers gra boom moved. One grabbed the other one and pulled him out of the way, and he crashed right. He crashed through all the through the oh. glass. Oh yeah, it looked like a it looked like a pretty uh, high free fall. Oh, it was. It was very very wild. Um, it is a parachute. Yeah, right. And then like, I don't know if you saw the aftermath, but his like back slowly started seeping blood out, and everybody was like, "Yeah, it was like bad." Like I was like, "Holy crap!" And all I could think about was, "Is Darby okay? And how is this affecting Sting's last match?" <laughs> and so it took me out of the match a little bit. But then it also kind of added to the story as like, "What's Sting gonna do?" So. Was it glass that he that he landed on, or yeah, yeah? So it was either like sugar glass or whatever the what's the glass they use for windshield? There's a certain name for it. Somebody was set, telling me that I think Magnum was telling me today what kind of glass it was, but I can't remember what it's called. Either way, it like it didn't shatter like you know like you would see. Do glass. I have to know that to be a genius? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't think so. <laughs> that's knowledge aspect. That's is knowledge. it bong glass? <laughs> bong glass. What yeah. is it, guys? Come on. Yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, um, another wild spot. And then did you hear, too, he's climbing Mount Everest? Who is? Darby. No, I didn't hear that. Yeah. That's, you know, I, I don't know that much about that. I mean, I know that, that it is used often um, to mark a – position of chasing the dreams of going for it and has the mystique of not everybody can do it but i don't know is that something that like like i did is that something out of 100 people that only you know three people would would survive or, or is it something that anyone can do i don't know no it's not so it's like Last year, there was a record set for the most deaths of people climbing Mount Everest. In okay. Oh, my God. Okay. People died trying to do it. 
Uh, 18 yeah. people? 18 people, yeah. Do you know how many people successfully climbed it? That's a good question. I don't know. That's a, you know what? That's an that's, IQ. That's an IQ answer right there, Rob. Yeah, I mean, I have to know that to have the full equation and understand. Let me that out. Who, how many I mean, it sounds cool, but um, yeah. I really don't know. But he's been training What's for it. People. Train it for it because there's no oxygen up there, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you gotta climb, climb, climb. It's miles and miles up, probably. Right. It's. I don't. I'm even gonna look right now. Here, let's see. Hmm. That's so, I don't know. Oh, and also, is it like one of those like where you where you got to like rock? You got to like rock climb to get to. It's probably not like a clear path. You can just take your your moped up, right? I know, right. Yeah. <laughs> there's nobody paved up a road there for you or nothing. Is like it? That. I wonder if it's if it's like you know where you got to like uh, throw a hook up and have a cable and and have it hook into the side and pull your, you know, it, it probably is. It's probably rock climbing. Yeah. It sounds like it would be. It sounds, you know, like, like a, a hell of a uh, challenge to take and a hell of a feat to accomplish. So if that's what you're looking to do, then it uh, seems like a good choice, but you know, maybe make it original and uh, go up upside down or backward. Yeah. Climb it, climb it with your hands, your feet first. Do it with your clothes on backwards. <laughs> no one's ever done that. Nobody's ever thought about that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So apparently uh, there was 667 summits that last that, year. Last year. I don't know if that means they completely climbed it or. Well, let's assume it means that. Let's, okay. uh, <laughs> so, and so 18 people died. They said 57% of all attempts by members were successful. So over half of okay. the people that attempted it did it successfully. Just a okay. little bit. So that tells me in order to go for it, you already got to be really, really prepared. And one of those crazy people that can survive outside while getting attacked by hyenas during a hurricane, mm -hmm. uh, those those people even you know even just to attempt it if if over half of them are making it that ain't your average joe yeah i bet you know it's like I, it, it reminds me of this like one time uh when i was in hawaii i was on the east side this um what's that beach called on the east side sandy beach and there was a sign that said um only um experienced very experienced uh swimmers or professionals uh go in the water and I looked at it, and I'm like, I'm at the beach. Hey, you're not going to violate my rights, bro. <laughs> <laughs> but it was the waves were so big and so choppy that day. I, I looked at the sign, and I didn't take it seriously. you know. And I walked out there, and the water was like uh, just up to my knees. And all of a sudden, this big wall of water came. Boom! And it hit me, and it picked me up upside down, and bam! It pile-drived me. And then... It stuck its finger up my ass and it bowled me. It bowled me up the shore. Whoa. My pants were down and I was like getting off the ground, you know, wiping sand out of my face, laughing, you know, because I was didn't know what other emotion. To, <laughs> that was funny, right? I just broke my neck. <laughs> the lifeguards were laughing their asses off. They said, bro, we were just about to come in and save you, man. You all right? I was like, I get it. Like, you got to be skilled and professional to even go out there in the knee deep water. So that's how I look at Mount Everest. I don't think it's for um, your average hiker. No way. Oh man. Like there'd be no way I would do it. I, it's like, I'm kind of okay with heights, I think for the most part, but uh, that's another kind of level of height. I would say <laughs> yeah. plus the elements going into play with it too. I would not be a fan of that, but Hey, good luck to Darby. You know, it's like, um, right. whew, that's a, that's quite the task to do. So, yeah good luck dude yeah yeah hey just wanted to tell you guys about factor meals i'm sure you've heard these on podcasts before but let me tell you straight from the horse's mouth i love these things uh i got the keto meal plan and it's just amazing six meals that i came in really easy to eat really easy to, to heat up and prepare and uh i had so much different chicken ones uh, there was a pork one that was really, really good. Um, and yeah, you have over 35 different options a week to choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. 
And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. What are you waiting for? Get started today and have a feel-good week of meals ready to go. Two-minute meals. Uh, Guys, I don't have a microwave. You can get those in two minutes. You can do them in the toaster oven, too. You can do them in an oven. It's seven minutes. And those, the tray that they, they provide for you is safe in the oven and stuff like that. And bam, it's so quick, so great. I Man, I like these things a lot. I, <laughs> I'm telling you, it's good stuff. But you fuel up fast with Factors restaurant quality meals that are ready to heat and eat wherever you are. Snacks, smoothies, and more. Discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day like breakfast, midday bites, and more. Sign up and save. We've done the math. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved to be nutritious and delicious. Factor is the perfect solution if you're looking for fast, upscale options done easy. Flexible for your schedule. Honestly, I'm always on the go, guys. I'm out of my apartment. I get restless in my apartment. So I'm always on the move, always doing writing outside of the work, doing the podcast here. So once I get try to get prepared and get set up, last thing I'm thinking about is prepping dinner and stuff like that. So factor really came into play and was a factor in making my day a lot easier, honestly. And the meals are great too. Um, so get as much as you need for choosing six to 18 meals per week. Plus you can pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. No prep, no mess meals. Factor meals are hundred percent ready to heat and eat. So there's no prepping, cooking, or cleanup needed. Head to factormeals.com slash RVD 50 and use code RVD50 to get 50% off. That's code RVD50 at factormeals.com slash RVD50 to get 50% off. Guys, it's a great deal too. Honestly, if you do the six meals, you get save so much money in regards to like takeout. Like I did Grubhub all the time. <laughs> and honestly, I would rack up so much money when it comes to this. This saves you so much money when it comes to even just doing six meals. This meal plan is great. There's They offer so much stuff. And guys, I want to try it more. So yes, you can do it too. Head to factormeals.com slash RVD50. Use promo code RVD50. Um, another thing to talk about uh, happened to be what we talked about a couple of weeks ago was um, you were t- we were talking about Sammy Guevara's spot and when he uh, locked out Jeff Hardy and stuff like that. And then obviously some dirt sheets kind of didn't tell it the right way in regards to how you interpreted it. But um, apparently, like what you were what you were saying was solid, you know, like you know, ca- kind of on Sammy for like what he did, like in just like high risk maneuver kind of thing, basically. Well, he got suspended for the spot, but it was because of um, communication or lack thereof, apparently. So Jeff was apparently injured earlier on in the match, or maybe right before. And protocol there is that you. Uh, have to be like you have to give the ref an opportunity to check on Jeff and see if he's okay, kind of thing. And what happened was that I think Sammy did the spot and then did his finisher without that happening. And so Sammy has gotten suspended from from AEW because of that. So uh, yeah, it's just like there sounds like you know maybe he just went against the thing that they had a p- protocol of sorts and you know could have just been whatever nerves you know just not thinking you know and that kind of aspect of it all, but. Um, so now here's one thing I'm wondering. If they're saying that Jeff was concussed before the the, the botched move, um, then are they saying or implying that that's the reason that Jeff got hit in the face with a knee? Was it on Jeff in his positioning? Is that, what, is that implied here? That's or? where I'm kind of stuck at too, Rob, because I think – I don't know if that was the finish of the match where, where Sammy. Regardless, hit. regardless. Because mm-hmm. well, I mean, no, I mean, because I think maybe that's maybe where Jeff got injured and they didn't give time to be checked on or something, and then Sammy went away with his finisher after that fact. I see. I see. Yeah, I didn't yeah. think about that. Maybe I'm seeing it all wrong then. Because I'm kind of looking at it that way too. Because I didn't. I ultimately I thought that was supposed to be the ending of the match or something, and something mm-hmm. happened. But maybe that's not the. Maybe there was just a little bit more that went on to it. So yeah, after the knee to the face, we're talking us. Uh, we're talking that time period. That makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. So I think I don't know what happened. Yeah, exactly. Some of the details are still cloudy for that kind of thing. I think so. Uh, but yeah, just a uh, interesting stuff. Sammy's very talented, very uh, athletic, and stuff like that. Jeff's is obviously a legend in the business too. So it's just like you hope the best for both of them when it comes to all that stuff. So. Oh. Yeah, you know, when uh, when I did my return for uh, to WWE, um, 
at the uh, Money in the Bank in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. 2013. They had added all the concussion protocols like since I left. So I didn't know a lot of this stuff. They had sat the wrestlers down in classrooms and like taught them stuff. Same thing with social media. But um, so during that match, you know, I'm, if you remember, it was, there was like a six man, Randy Orton and, um, um, it was Red the money in the bank match, right? What's that? It was the money in the bank match itself. For the yeah, league. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was my big return. In yeah, Philly. yeah, Philly. I was there for that actually. Okay. Yep. Awesome. It was so that was actually it was a whole that whole tour was awesome, but um, that whole run. But it um, before we go out there, someone told me, you know, you can't you can't get busted open. Um, they changed that now. Things are different, and uh, if if there's any blood, they, they, you got to roll out, you know, yeah. and, uh, and, and the doctor is at ringside now, which didn't used to be, and he will check you, try to stop your bleeding. And if you can stop your bleeding and you're good to go, you roll into the match, you know, and, and continue. Otherwise they will stop the match. And I was like, Oh my God, what? Like going into my big return, it's all built up. I got all these guys I'm going to be doing all these amazing things with and stuff. And if I just get busted open earlier, boom, I'm done. Like that was a lot of pressure. Yeah. And so yeah. what happens is Seamus takes a ladder, boom, hits me like right in the face with it. I can't remember where I spouted blood from, but I was like, oh, no, 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 no. And they said, go see the doctor. I'm like, Fuck. I rolled over there to the under the rope and the doctor's checking me and I'm thinking, oh my God, like uh let me let me finish my story. My story. Let me finish my story. <laughs> he stopped it from bleeding. I rolled in and continued the match. But that to me was a major change in the business. And that, of course, was you know 12 years ago. They've definitely made some changes since then that I'm not aware of. That's they probably should fill me in on um but you know obviously as education comes in perspective changes as does as it does with uh time as well so so it's good that we're learning you know how to be safer um in in, in a lot of these ways you know as a performer i'm not sure i'm too cool with that one bleed and you're out of here kind right, of then you're done yeah Kind of I guess it had a lot to do with the sponsors of the of the live show. Well, I think the like problem that. was going on at that time was Linda McMahon was running for political office back then. So and I think they wanted to be clean cut as possible, where it's like if nothing blows back on her to get dirt on her about, you know, oh, bloody wrestling, blah, blah, blah. And then it gets put in the mainstream media or whatever. I think they were kind of being walking on eggshells with that kind of thing, I think, at the time. Mm, okay. So. Uh, and there's also, so I did find a little bit more about the clarity with this uh, Sammy Guevara thing. Uh, Dave Meltzer gave further information on why Guevara was suspended by AEW. He stated that Guevara had a broken, had broken Hardy's nose performing the shooting star press and the company enforced concussion protocol, meaning they needed to finish the match immediately. However, with Guevara deciding to hit his finisher, the company was angry at him for not following instructions and he was suspended regardless of whether or not Hardy had a concussion, which he didn't. It's unclear exactly oh, yeah. when it's, so he didn't have one, but it was part of against con, pro, uh, protocol when his knees hit him that they didn't get, give him a time to check. They're supposed to go home immediately, a bit, basically, like finish the match immediately. And I wonder what terminology defines when we're to go home immediately if he's might be concussed or not. Because, I mean, now – how do I know? I just drop kicked the guy. I caught him in his lip a little bit. I don't know. He might be concussed or something. You know, should I, you know, should I just fucking roll him up? Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing too. Well, I think what happens is they, they have a thing in, in place, maybe where the ref gets the doctor. I think they have a concussion doctor ringside now. I think if I'm not mistaken, I don't know, okay. but I think that's, they need to allow that kind of opportunity to happen. So, but yeah, that's but, your but, point, but, though. Are you saying he didn't allow that to happen? No. So he, uh, instead, they he went for and hit his finisher on Jeff after that happened. So, like, instead of just going, like, right home or having them check on, giving them the right time to check for him. I, I don't know. It seems it's just a sticky situation, it kind of seems. Hmm. Do you know what his finisher is? 
I think it's a top rope move where it's like a Phoenix splash or something like that. Something akin to that. Um, I know it's a or Spanish fly or something. No, he wouldn't have gave him a Spanish fly. Huh. I was trying to think of the name of that stupid move recently. Oh, the, the Canadian destroyer. No, the Spanish fly. I feel the same way about that one. I feel like everybody does it now. And you know what stupid move, Rob? I bet you don't like it either, too. It's like when they put you in the tree of woe. And Del Rio, I think, used to do this or something. But, like, the guy would be hanging in the tree of ro woe. And, like, you, the guy would just kind of float there. The, the guy that the victim would be floating there. And then the guy jumps down onto the dude. It's almost like you wait for the guy to stomp on you. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like stomp you down from the top rope. Mm, I think maybe I know what you mean, but but I got to say this to that. If you have never been hung upside down on the tree of woe and had your feet um, folded underneath the turnbuckle, uh -huh. then, then I suggest you do that and then revisit this because it is okay. very it's not easy to get out. It fucking yeah. hurts. It hurts your calves uh -huh. and it hurts your shin, depending on how, how the fold is. But like a lot of times when I'm hanging upside down, I'm like, oh, I'm like, I'm <laughs> yes, oh man. <laughs> <And> I <re> <laughs> that was perfect, actually. Boom. Yeah, no, a lot of times I'm like really like reaching up there, like, mother fuck, I can't wait to get unhooked because it's just like having a pain on the, like your calf squeezed. Um, and, and sometimes, you, you know, you, you, sometimes somebody needs help, you know, I don't know if I've ever actually need help. I know I've been close, but I think that I've always been able to get it, but sometimes it takes a lot longer than I want to. Like I, you know, they, I, they really had me hooked and up there and I'm like, God damn it. Just cause of the leverage, cause the way all of my weight is pulling down on my leg is making my, my shin go up underneath yeah. the turn buckle and it's 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 fighting me. My own leg is fighting me and it hurts. So I just want to add that. You know, okay. I think if, it, if, if anybody that's wrestled in the chat room has been in a tree of woe and has never had it hurt, I'd be surprised because, man, that's like one of those things where um, – but when it hurts, it's like getting a cramp. It's that yeah. bad. It's, it's like, oh, 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 you want to stop it immediately. Yeah. All right, you sold me. I'm fine with it then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that looks tough enough for me. Like, if I'm trying to escape out of that, yeah, and like your leg, oh my God, yeah. Baby, have you ever been hung upside down on the tree? Whoa. Yeah. Have you ever gotten stuck like that? No. Oh. Have you, does it, have you ever gotten hurt? Like where it hurts your legs when you're tied up under it? Um, only after I just got tattooed. Oh, <laughs> they take it easy on her. She's a girl. She's the only girl in the class. <laughs> <laughs> Those dang trio woes. I tell you what. Um, Trey Nelson chimes in again. Thank you again for the nine ninety nine. Oh, uh, little little love. He's got the zoomies. Love right going, on. On. going going nuts. I love it when the pets get zoomed. Hey, Barbie. Come here, Barbie. Say hi, Barbie. We got both doggies on this week. Oh, yeah. about that. Look at both making cameos. Oh, oh. oh look at that. You don't want to be on here. He's like, oh, not right now. Yeah. I didn't know she had brown paws. I thought she was pure black. Yeah, it's yeah, she's got brown, and it's 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 funny because they have like some opposite um design yeah. colors yeah. They're the same um breed. So same breed but different colors. Adorable. Uh, Bar uh, Barbie's a whopping um 12 pounds and the oh, man uh, and little one there is like uh, three and a half pounds you know. holy smokes big kahunas there yeah <laughs> our guard dogs your guard dogs trey nelson he asked do you think today's product has too much no sell and high spots to look to choreograph even the wrestlers on the mic argue like children on a playground will ever see another attitude era lots to take in there rob so do you think there's too many no no selling in high spots that look choreographed? And what do you think about people on the the mic exchanges promo people on promos lately? Right, love you, baby. I love you, baby. Love you, D. Love you, Bobby. Love you Jennifer. Love you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yes. You know. I mean, what can I say? I did an interview with uh, Bill Apter. I think this was the interview the other day where I was asked, it was either by him or maybe by someone else. I do more than I do several. But anyway, 
was I okay with the way that the business was changing and that it was, you know, maybe it was even you that asked me, but I was like, I, I, I kind of am because I have to be, you know, and it's evolving. It is what it is. So, so that is part of that. But for, for me, because I have, my perspective is rooted in my old school foundation. Yeah. I look at a lot of that as, um, as steering away from what, what it should be and what was instilled into me when I was training. So, so it used to be, um, way back in 89, when I started schooling with the original Sheik, the, uh, the number one rule in the business was to protect the business at all costs. Because everyone made their living off of that, off of drawing fans in. They didn't want to kill the business. They didn't want to, you know, they wanted people to uh, to be into their storylines and their, their matchups. It was very important and crucial uh, for them. And I broke in where um, it was like, I guess, the tail end of that, probably. And um, because of that, it was a lot stiffer. You know, in all Japan, we beat the shit out of each other. When I got trained with Sheik, if I ever had a black eye, a broken nose, or busted open or whatever, they always told me it's it was too. You know, it's, it's good for the business. And I always felt like it was all through ECW. I always loved when I had like a black eye, um, which was very often. And, uh, and I loved it. I thought that it made me feel more like uh, like a fighter. Um, now, because society has changed so much, today's product of wrestling has evolved into a uh, work safe, friendly environment with equal opportunity. It went from a good old boys, secret society behind the doors kind of club to um, anybody can and should be able to do this, have the right to do it, feel like they're treated equally. And, you know, I'm not sure it was meant to be that, but that's that's where I see today's product, like it's on the verge of that, of doing that transformation. And, uh, and, and because of that, it's more important, you know, um, to, not for me, but it seems like it's more important for uh, today's wrestlers especially if they're just trained today with today's values. I think the number one rule, instead of protect the business at all costs, now I think the number one rule, maybe, and for sure at some schools I've heard this is fact, the number one rule is safety first. And if I get asked, how'd you make those kicks look so good? It was not worrying about the safety, not having that pressure of, Oh my God! I better make sure he's he's looking at me right now, and he and he's completely ready for me, and 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 I got to make sure that you know I throw this kick perfect and don't hurt him. Instead, I had the opinion of, oh well, at least if I catch him and give him a mark on his face, it's good for the business. So that really was the difference in, in a lot of things. So now it's more about high spots. It's fans that grew up not trained the way that I was and instead mm -hmm. feeling like it was a more of everyone working together in a friendly kind of non-competitive group effort. Like it's fans that grew up faking that, that became the product. And so now it's a, it's a, it's a hybrid of that philosophy mixed with some respect for the old school um, foundation that a few of us still carry. Yeah. Yeah. And you've mentioned it before. And I know Sabu's mentioned it before too, is like when she taught you guys, it was all like ground wrestling and making it look like keeping the legitimately keeping the other person down and trying to like, you know, beat the other person in a lot of ways. And like, you know, so you have that kind of foundation of it all. And, and what that, what that did for us was it gave us a mindset, mm -hmm. a mindset that, that, that was um, unchangeable so that when we have it turned on, and and where we're into our character and we're in the middle of a, a match or a fight, we don't check in and out of it. We don't check in and out of it. You know what I mean? Like we're yeah, committed. Yeah. We're committed. There's no slow mode. And um, and that's the kind of thing that keeps us uh, from exposing 
things that are now right there for for everyone to see like okay look there's 15 people standing there with their arms up waiting to catch somebody that hasn't even gone off the other ropes yet right there's not room for that if you have the mindset that i do if me and sabu were in that group of 15 people we'd be punching everybody around bam 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 until until the last second and then we'd get hit by it and then there'd be a reason to be on the ground and that's just it's not just it's not in the little things it's in the it's in believing what you're doing and the commitment and the mindset it's not really just the little things you know it's it's in believing what you're doing and if if they grew up not believing it then then they, and they still don't believe in it then um they're gonna have a hard time uh convincing you as the watcher to believe in it yeah, great point, Rob. It's it's always a fascinating discussion too, and I know uh, Kevin Nash on his, the latest podcast, he they were kind of talking about it too, and he mentioned how it's like almost like wrestling today is tailored for those ten second clips that people see, like people's attention span of ten seconds, and that's what a lot of it seems to be tailored for. And to to a lot of people's points, I think you've mentioned it too. It's like people see like these kids grew up like my age and younger playing video games and seeing what goes on in the video games. I want to be like what it's on the video game. <laughs> it's kind of not like that. that you well, I, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, let's face it, a lot of times it's like, boom, a, boom, a wrestler slams a wrestler down. Let's say on a table, Uh huh. walks down, walks down the hallway, waits in line for the elevator. Oh, elevator's full. I'll catch the next one. Next one you know, comes on, ding, it opens up. Oh, after you, gets on the elevator, hits three, goes up on the elevator, boom, goes out. Um, excuse me, uh, how do I get to the uh, bleachers? Oh, it's just, okay, thank you. Goes out, walks out there, uh, and crashes through. And then the people will still pop for them so they don't know that what they just did is the stupidest thing that's ever been done in wrestling. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. You want to make sure those uh, the stakes are always there, and you don't. Know? It's just about the end result to them. They're not worried about protecting the business along the way because they don't think there's anything to protect anymore. But it still comes out in our art form, mm-hmm. and that's the difference. Yeah, hundred percent. Rob, you're known for your five star frog splash, but some people don't get the star ratings they actually want in the bedroom. So no better time to bring this up. Hey, this episode is brought to you by Blue Chew. Let's talk about sex. Guys, remember the days when you were always ready to go? Now you can increase your performance and get the extra confidence in bed. Listen up, BlueChew.com. BlueChew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable tablets and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. Process is simple. Sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive prescription within days. The best part? It's all done online. So no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversations, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. BlueChew tablets are made in the USA and prepared and shipped direct to your door in a discreet package. Does it work? Don't you think you need it? Try it for free for a month and see. You're going to love it. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at BlueChew.com. Chew it and do it, baby. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free. F-R-E-E. When you use our promo card, guess promo code, guess what it is? Guess what? It's R-V-D. That's right. Promo code R-V-D at checkout. You just pay $5 shipping. That's BlueChew.com. Promo code R-V-D to receive your first month free visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information and we thank blue chew for sponsoring the podcast one of a kind baby um jem the dawn thank you for the two dollars he said what's the most extreme thing you did outside of wrestling rob what would you say the most extreme thing outside of the ring hmm that's well I, i'm gonna here, here's what comes to mind because, you know, there's different ways to take uh, extreme as an adjective and apply it towards different different thoughts, different directions. And I'm thinking, you know, extreme sports, right? Yeah. Uh, I was a big fan when I was, I don't know, I guess a young adult or older teenager. But, I, you know, when they started doing the, 
the the bike tricks and um uh i got what was that skateboard those three things at first i guess it was the motocross was the other one but anyway i just thought wow these guys are doing stuff that um is stunts that i saw um danny not danny cats johnny blaze do in the ghost rider comic yeah. book he worked at a carnival stunt show and he would do these things that now have been like completely completely blown away back then it was like whoa he's going no handed with his arms crossed on a motorcycle doing a loop-de-loop and then jumping like whoa can you can you imagine if someone did that in real life and now you know they've gone so far past that um but i would say for me the most extreme uh, thing that I've done is probably jump out of an airplane. I did it twice. Um, I wanted to parachute and experience that. I did it in Walterboro, South Carolina. And uh, they they offered a few different kinds. There's tandem jump, which means that your line is somehow attached to – no, tandem is you got a partner on your back, a coach with you, and you go down – Static line is somehow the cord is attached to the airplane. So when you jump, eventually it pulls the cord for you. And then the, mo the most expensive one was called accelerated free fall, in which case you are actually pulling your own cord. And uh, I went for that one and I did it. Uh, and I went back and I did it again. Um, I thought that I would keep going. If you go eight times, then you're then you qualify for i think to start packing your own shoot or something and you you work your way up the more trips you have the last time i went i remember there was a dude there it was his 21st birthday and his goal was to jump 21 times in that day so like every time a plane would go up you know he would he would try and get on every single plane that was that was uh going up and um, it was fun for me. I was disappointed in the fact that I wasn't scared. It didn't feel like my heartbeat was even um, changed. It didn't feel, there was no nervous feel. And maybe part of that was because they gave us so much training before we go up. And you practice going for your rip cord, and you you know you practice how to do a you know a right turn, a left turn, and how to how to you know go in and dive, and you you practice all this shit so many times during the day that at the at the end when you finally go up on the plane, I felt pretty damn prepared. Felt like nothing was going to happen. If my chute doesn't open and I hit a thousand feet, the emergency chute opens anyway. All of that, and I was depressed at the time too, because I was, you know, going through a breakup with a, uh, with a girl that I was with uh, for, for a long time, uh, on and off again, and this was one of the off times, I guess. And because of that too, I have that like, I don't really care what happens to me kind of feeling that comes with that. Right. All that combined, I was like, I was out there like. Dude, I bet my heart rate's the same right now. Like, I don't even, I wanted to be like, ah, and instead, you know, I kind of just felt like, and you even got to practice after you jump when you're, when you're, when you're falling down, plummeting, you actually got like certain exercises you got to do. And there's a dude that's grabbed onto your fucking jacket like that, maybe two dudes, and they watch you practice all that. And then you get down. Oh, and then you got to look at your altimeter and read to this guy, 3,000 feet, 3,000 feet, whatever it is. Wait for him to check back. Wait for him to check back. They give you so much to do. You don't really, at least for me, I didn't have time to focus on the fact that I was plummeting towards uh, gravity's call. And then when they finally let go, it was a few seconds till it was 1,000 feet or, or so, and it was time for me to pull it. So, um, But that was pretty extreme. I would say so. Yeah. Skydiving. That's pretty, that's pretty. And like doing the accelerated one too. That's another thing. Jeez. Bro. Ooh, man. I don't know if I, yeah, skydiving. That's something I'd have to really consider to do. Hmm. All right. We have unsweet tige. Thanks for the $5. <laughs> he said, good to see you guys this evening. Rob, did you ever see the shoot video of new Jack saying he would shoot Joe Mo effing ass? I guess cracks me up. RIP new Jack. You ever see that shoot interview? You know what he's talking about? No, I didn't. I did not. I haven't seen him say he was going to shoot my. I don't know if he meant you or just in somebody in general. Right. I'm going to, you know, knowing what I know, 
I'm going to take that as if maybe he did say me. And there is a little story to that. You know, um, most people know now I make it a practice to not put negative energy out into the universe. Before, honesty was just higher on my value list than worrying about if it was negative or positive energy, you know, till I reached a certain age. And before that, you can catch me talking shit about some people. And um, Sean Oliver was asking me in a you shoot about New Jack. And I remember saying uh, at the time that uh, I didn't think he, he knew how to do a headlock. You know, he was like what me and Sabu referred to as like garbage wrestlers. They would literally go out there with garbage cans and just hit people over the head. And uh, a lot of wrestlers do that in death matches and such and don't know how to wrestle at all. You really don't have to know how to wrestle to be able to do all that. And um, at that time, I I thought that of New Jack when I when I recalled my answer when I was asked during the interview and that was what I gave. I said, you know, that um, you know, I didn't think he had that much and I thought and I didn't respect him uh his energy either because he had a negative energy, you know, and I've I think I've talked about that, but I've been around when he's been screaming like a gangster uh one time that's really memorable. I'm not sure I was wrong on this one you know, for my feelings, but we were all in a hotel room. Normally I wouldn't be in the same room as New Jack, but maybe sometimes, you know, but not normally, but we're all in this room for some reason in 97. Uh, I, I don't know, maybe 98. I, I was thinking these are two different, things, different times I just thought of, but Brian Pillman had just died. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this is actually not 2007. I'm talking about, sorry, I'm talking about 90. 98, 99, yeah. 98. I think it's 98. Anyway, 98. we're all in hotel room. Yeah. We're in a hotel room and we're talking about it, the fact that the news had just came out and everyone's just like in the room, all the boys are just like, man, I can't believe he died. Damn, it was a really morbid kind of energy, you know, kind of somber. Everyone was just like, God, he was just here. And then uh, New Jack goes, well, good. I hope he is dead. I hope he died. And if he didn't die, then I hope he does die. And I hope he's dead. And I hope he's in the ground right now already. And I hope worms are eating his eyeballs. And that was one of my first impressions of New Jack, where I really was judging him as, who is this dude that I'm alone in, in a room with, that I'm around, that I'm not normally around, except for like dressing room where there's a bunch of people and I did judge him by that and thought you know not the kind of guy that I want to hang out with <laughs> and, and also you know uh, that just sounded like a fucking horrible thing to say and so I did answer Sean Oliver's answer accordingly and then uh, he interviewed New Jack and he, and he asked New Jack about me and he said did you ever see this where are these talking about you and he showed New Jack that video um, and then New Jack was like, well, damn. Well, I never knew. I never knew RVD felt like that. We well, should have said something then. Well, fuck him then. Well, fuck RVD then. He should have said something to me. You feel like that, man. Shit. No, fuck him. Not No, no, fuck him. You know, and I saw New Jack shortly after that in Raw Way. Uh, but I had made my change to where I was like, that's not me anymore. You know, like I didn't feel. Um, one, I don't, you know, want to fucking put negative energy out there anyway and talk bad about people. But also, I also, I, you know, looking at the bigger picture, you know, there's other times around New Jack where he does show like a human side. And I figure, who, you know, I don't know how much he's in the character and how much he commits to it. And also, I don't know what his beef was with Brian Pillman. I mean, they had, so he had something personal with him. I thought it was rude and callous to call, call that out in front of everybody. And I mean, I still will look at it like that in front of a bunch of people that were hurt, that were mourning his loss. But either way, you know, I, I went up to New Jack, you know, when I saw him and, uh, you know, I was just like, I could crush this guy. Hey, New Jack. Hey, bro. No, nah, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, yeah, I saw him a couple times after that at conventions and just treated him like, 
you know, like, hey, he's he's just that dude that uh, used to do that. Whether well, I don't know why he made those choices, but firsthand experience, he didn't do nothing to me. And really, like a lot of times, I feel like it's best to judge people uh, from that. But that was my firsthand experience was hearing him say that. And another time in, in Boston, after he gimmicked that kid, sliced the, that Eric Kulas kid open his forehead, yeah. um, he was in the back, New Jack. Uh, while everyone was trying to get him out the back door so he didn't get into trouble with the cops and shit. And they were saying, dude, you fucking boom. Woo -woo. Hey, man, no, seriously, bro. Bro, the kid is fucked up. He said, good, good, man. I hope he die. I hope he fucking die. And that was, you know, like 97, like my first year or within my first, you know, 12 to 18 months of ECW. So I was like, that was the new Jack that I knew. So that's who I was commenting on. Yeah, yeah, maybe he might have said something about I, I, I I'm gonna shoot you, shoot or whatever. You. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Jeez, yeah, but um, yeah, like uh, the Brian Pillman, yeah, he passed away. It probably was late '97, Rob, because it said uh, October 5th, 1997 is when he passed away. So um, probably just a tail in there. Yep. Um, but yeah, craziness. Um, let me see here. Hey, we got this episode. I got to do a sponsorship. This episode is sponsored by Get Blitzed. Get Blitzed. Uh, it's a Lit Aid nano infused THC syrup, and it is premium cannabis infused syrup formulated with nanotechnology for fast acting effects. It stands out with its advanced nanotechnology formulation, which allows for quicker onset and enhanced potency compared to regular THC syrups. It can be mixed with your favorite beverage, such as soda, tonic water, juice, or used as a drizzle on food for a delicious cannabis experience. Guys, it is legal in all 50 states. It's by Mickey Ray Sinatra and Courtney, uh, based out of Maryland. So if you're in the Maryland area, you can get it there. But you can go to get-blitz.com right now and use promo code RVD to get 15% off. That's 15% off all your whole order of it. And they have uh, a pat like packages you can get, or you can get single bottles. Uh, plenty of different flavors from cherry to key lime pie to, I believe, pina colada. There's a whole lot more, too, you guys can check out. So go to get-blitz.com and use promo code RVD to get 15% off your order. Check out getblitz.com. So thank you, Get Blitz. All right. Um, Rob, something else that uh, kind of tied into what – we we mentioned before about you making when you left WWE like it was it 2007 you you made your leave was it okay okay, okay. so uh, Mercedes Monet who's a hot free agent right now uh, a lot of people are speculating she's gonna show sure up is there. hot yeah hey oh hey oh <laughs> showing up at Big Business potentially next week at AEW she was asked about when she walked out on WWE back in May of 2022. And she said, that's a big question. That's a big, big question. I really believe not only in the universe, but I believe in myself and a higher power of light that comes over me. Something inside me told me that I needed to go and do this and stand up for myself. It was a very hard decision because wrestling in WWE has been my whole life. People don't know. It's been my whole life. It's the hardest decision I've ever had to make in my whole life, but it's the proudest. It's crazy because I would not be sitting here living the best version of my life and getting to be everything I've ever dreamt of. And more. It makes me so excited because that moment changed my whole life for the better. I'm so thankful for that moment. I'm so proud of myself. I'm so proud of Trinity, who is uh, Naomi and WWE, of just how strong we were. Everybody wanted to talk about it. Everybody wanted to act like they were in the room. Everybody wanted to act like they were in the room or worked there or were backstage or knew what happened or knew what was said. All I know is I handled it like a CEO, like the boss that I am with mm -hmm. my head held high. I can't say anything but amazing things. WWE. I'm so thankful for the career they gave me, the fans they gave me, the life they gave me, the dreams that they gave me. So many dreams. I got to chase and live them all. I got to do so much more. I have a lot of unfinished business in wrestling in a lot of places. So, yeah, Rob, when I read that quote, it made me think of you and like how you kind of just you thought it was for your best interest to leave. And it ended up being that for you. Right. Yeah. It's really cool to hear her sound like. She was speaking from my perspective because uh, somewhere Katie saw where, um, I don't know if it was an interview or maybe she even told Katie, I don't know, but that I inspired her to be a wrestler, that, that she saw me somewhere, whatever. I'm sure it wasn't just me, but I can't remember the story. 
Um, but that I, you know, and, and so, so, you know, when you mentioned her, I thought of that right away. And then when you were talking about her saying when she decided to be a wrestler, this and that, I was like, is he going to mention me? Cause I was, I need a reminder on how that went, but, um, you know, I'm a fan of hers uh, as a fan and, uh, I, I like her, you know, personally, she's super cool. And, um, and just, you know, uh, she's got that swagger and she's got that appeal to, you know, to where everyone's going to want to follow her and see, uh, see what she does, where she ends up. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah pretty darn cool. And it definitely made me think of you and your situation too. And that's awesome that's- that she, once you got a brand that people really care about, man, it carries over. And, you know, the put enough time into your brand, it'll carry on, you know, longer than your flesh will. Mm-hmm. Yep. 100%. Yeah. Um, Ryan Birch, thank you for the $5. He says, great comment about catching wrestlers earlier. I appreciate it when a wrestler is getting pinned and isn't staring at the ref so they can kick out. So that's another aspect that he yeah does. yeah it, it, it's something that bothers me personally is when they don't even fucking kick out they think that just like making a jerking movement is good enough and their shoulders are still down i will pause it every time i see that and rewind it and point that out to katie and say watch they're still pinned one two three the shoulders never fucking left the mat they didn't even try all they did was kick their feet out like who taught them that that's a kick out and it's like sometimes Sometimes I get like, oh, I need to have a seminar. Then I'm like, no, I'm not going to want to do that. I'm not going to do that. (laughs) Yeah, but there's really no platform to reach all the talent and and share with them what I could share with them that would help them. At least, well, you know, like like she said, like Mercedes said, the universe will provide a uh, time and place if it's ever – if it's ever organic and, and, and meant to be. But as far as, like, teaching people and stuff, I don't think I have the patience, and I really don't want to reach – people in the business by talking outside of the business like this, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the uh, paradox there or, or the complex situation anyway. So, but um, that, that, that bothers me though. Yeah. They look at the raft and they watch and then uh, half the time they, they're, they're pinned anyway. And I'm like, why did the ref not count three? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I also heard uh, William Regal when he did his podcast, he would talk about, how putting the effort into pinning like is something that a lot of wrestlers don't do. Like, you know, like you, you may have to make it look like you're trying to pin in the guy, you know, and uh, he'll make note of a lot of that when he sees that not happen too, when there's just a cat. Yeah. Pin. And sometimes you'll have a cocky pin to tell the story, but then other times you just like, there's no reason for it. like not having a good pin. One time after this is when uh, TNA, um, the first run through there. So this is like 2012. And um, Bruce Pritchard was there in Gorilla. And um, after, yeah, I, when I walked back after my match, and I mean, he'd been there for a long time, too, you know, long time. Yeah. I walked to the Gorilla position, which is when you walk by the agents, producers after your match, and he's, he says, Rob. And he, he Rob, and he, and he calls me over, and I'm like, oh my God, someone's going to actually say something to me because <laughs> nobody ever gave me any feedback about anything when I was there, which is one of the reasons that made it, you know, one of the easiest jobs ever. But at the same time, like I just, you know, like I said, I had both runs in TNA. I have no idea how, how the office felt about their investment in me. But anyway, Rob, it's a dog. You have something to say about my match? I went, or the, he goes, Rob, after you did the Rolling Thunder, when you covered him, you you put your uh, your hands on his on his shoulder instead of just like laying across them. I said, yeah. He said, yeah, and you were like pressing down on his shoulder with your weight. I said, yeah, I do that every time. He goes, I just I just want to point that out that I saw that that was that was cool. You know, I appreciated that. You know, that difference. Yeah. He meant it as a compliment, but then when I walk away, I that just showed me that he's never, ever seen me ever, ever do a cover after Rolling Thunder or at the end, even after a frog splash. Basically, it tells me that he's never watched me or paid attention because I always, always, always do that. Yeah. I've even had feet, I've had heat from some fan, some keyboard fans saying that's disrespectful to not hook their leg, you know, like for the fans <laughs> and stuff. And um yeah somewhere i got along the line of when i lay across them i put all my weight like on their shoulder to try to hold it down and and yeah some you know he meant it as a compliment 
but it came across kind of insulting because I'm like, dude, you're in, you're, you're looking at that monitor every match I've had for the last 12 months, and you just noticed that tonight. <laughs> But, dude, like, I like that, too. Like, yeah, making sure you – sometimes, like, I think hooking the leg is not as disrespectful. It's like if you keep the pin down on the shoulders, that's where you've got to keep Whatever. Yeah. Whatever. You work the way you work. <laughs> Whatever, you know. I don't I don't think everyone should do it the same anyway, but I'm trying to hold them down to get the cup. To get yeah, the that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Jem the Dawn chimes in again Thank, for for the two dollars. Thanks, Jem. He says your water spitting promo on Triple H was hilarious. Thanks, dude. Yeah, I got a lot of. Um, that's one that goes down in the history books, I guess, because fans will always find the meme and post it, <laughs> talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I think it was a combination of who I was picking on, making fun of, and, and also the fact that it. The, of what I was pointing out, you know, like, yeah. okay, you spit water. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Yep. <laughs> okay, Rob, we'll close out with this stuff here. Uh, something I was kind of making note. I was like, kind of you look to see what happened on this day in history, like, you know, when it comes to like when the podcast drops. So we drop every Monday at 4 20 p.m. Hi, right, guys. So if you want the episode, go Premier. to premiere. On premiere, that's when well, it drops. Premiere will drop early on premiere, but every Monday at 4 20 p.m., we drop on podcast feed, all podcast feeds, and we'll drop on rvdtv.com too. So check them out there. And uh, yeah, so, so, but so on this day in history, which will be March 11th, it'll be on Monday, but on March 10th, 1993, is when Dino Bravo got killed uh, and his mafia ties that he had. Um, he was found shot dead home while watching hockey in Vermont, Lavelle, Quebec. He was shot 17 times, it says, seven in the head and 10 in the torso. Though there are allegations that he's involved in a cigarette smuggling ring, it was never officially proven. Rick Martell, a fellow Canadian wrestler and friend of Bresciano, which is Dino Bravo's real name, believe his popularity in Montreal area had upset some members of the mafia. Bresciano, a nephew of the Montreal crime boss, Vic Catroni, by marriage, May have been linked to Cotroni's organization in the days prior to his death. Bresciano confided in the friends that he knew his death was imminent, like it was coming. And Bresciano's murder had never been officially solved. Rob, were you kind of fascinated by that aspect, being a mafia fan? And then obviously, this Dino Bravo, a notable wrestler. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, dude, for sure. Um, and, and, you know, I like Dino Bravo even as a fan when he's, I remember him setting the uh, bench press record. Um, the world best press record was like 705 pounds or maybe 712. Both of those sound right. I saw a guy with my own eyes bench um, over 900 pounds recently in front of me. And I, and I went back, I went back and I, I remember when the world record, I, I said that to him afterwards. This was at the, this was at the Mr. Olympia. I don't know if I've ever even put that video on yet on my YouTube page, but I have the footage. I think I still have to edit that. Damn it. Doing it, doing it this week. Happening. So many plates. Uh, nine hundred and ten, I think, or nine away. But anyway, he was a fan. Afterwards, he's like, can I get a picture? I'm like, bro, what the? Do you, I said, do you remember when the world record when the D Dino Bravo did like just over seven? And he was like, yeah, yeah. He was like, Shh. he's just you know fanboy, and you know, look at the. Can we do another one? And uh, anyway. That was impressive as shit, and uh, that was a big part of my fandom, the years that I grew up watching it. Jesse Ventura only helped two pounds worth when he pulled on the bar because he's got <laughs> expert, expert fingers. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, I had to go back and visit that one time when I was like, wait a minute. I'm, like, totally fascinated by all the mafia history, Dino Bravo got killed by the mafia. I need to go back and like really dive into that and, and see what, you know, how that relates to the, the world that I know now. And so, so yeah, I did that, you know, and Dino, it appears he was actually working for them, you know, and it makes sense, you know, that someone like that, there's so many stories, of guys, especially big guys like that. When, when they're in neighborhoods where, Everyone's mafia. A lot of times those guys end up, you know, just going and collecting debts for them mm -hmm. you know, because one of the main businesses that uh, the mobsters do is uh, is putting their money out on the streets. 
and they charge a VIG and, you know, 3%, 5% a week, whatever, put $1,000 out there. And if someone has to pay you back $200 a week, every single week, until they give you the full original $1,000 back, you can make a lot of money with that. Um, but how do you get them to pay you? And you need people like Dino Bravo to go shake them down, you know, and hey, don't make me come after you. You Every Friday, you need to be there paying them your fucking VIG. And, and uh, Dino did that for a while. Um, his uncle was Victor uh, Catroni, who was the boss of the of the Montreal uh, Mafia. Um, yeah. The, the ownership went back and forth from the Rizzutos um, to him, and they're related as well, the Catroni and the Rizzutos. And uh, the Rizzutos, you know, they, they worked with the American Mafia, um, with the Bonanos, um, and so they're a lot more known in our history than the Catronis. But up there, man, that was the boss, and it seems like uh, – it seems like Dino got into a little bit of trouble. From what I understand, um, there was a, a warehouse full of um, untaxed uh, c cigarettes, and uh, he was uh, trying to make some money on the side, middlemanning a deal, and and, it's, and the pickup didn't happen in time, and the product stayed in the warehouse a little too long. So when the pickup was there, the cops were already there, and everyone got busted. And I also heard maybe a little cocaine got introduced into the into the whole equation. And you know, he was he was. I think it's fair to say he was an associate, and he was doing some some uh, mafia work. And then um, boom, after that bust. Man, they must have just figured that he could bring everybody down because that's what they do. Anybody that has information, they seem to whack them out so that they don't get in trouble. They hire you to go do a job uh, and you do it either because you're hired or out of respect, out of your your commitment and love and patronage to the family, everything, and you, and, and you do it, the job, and then – and then if someone gets busted, then boom, they cut the line off right there. And they, you got to die just so that they don't get in trouble. For, I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's, that's how they operate. Just like with uh, a lot of people know the movie Goodfellas. Everyone gets whacked there because of the bank heist. Everyone that had any information, Frank Burke, who Robert De Niro plays uh, Jimmy Conway, that's based on Fred Burke. And um, he whacked everybody that had any knowledge of it so that he wouldn't, get told on and it's just like it's just you know it's such a, a god complex in perspective to have everyone's lives in your hands like that and to figure that wiping their lives out is worth saving yours or just extending it for a little bit and then sometimes you end up going to prison anyway and then do they regret it do they do they feel like well damn i guess i didn't have to kill those 13 <laughs> people anyway it didn't even do any good <laughs> gee whiz <laughs> crazy, crazy, crazy. But yeah, so yes, uh, Dino Bravo, man, I saw him live lots of times. So I'm at the Kellogg Center uh, wrestling, uh, and um, he was part of WWE right then when I was like, man, I want to wrestle, and I was going to every show that I could. Yeah. Oh, man. What a dude, too. He was only 44 when he got killed. And um, on top of that, too, uh, yeah, he claimed that it was 715 pounds was the record. So Okay. Um, okay. That, yeah. That's at least what I read on, on the Internet. So take that for what you will, guys. Um, his but, aunt was married to Victor Catroni. Yeah, because it was his uncle-in-law, apparently, is what they, they were saying. But, man, holy smokes. I know they did a dark side of the ring on him. I got to watch that. Uh, I think that would be pretty fascinating. Yeah, it's good. All right, Rob. Uh, your day in history, actually, uh, in 2002, March 11th, it was Monday night, and it was a Raw. You actually tagged with the Hardy bro brothers, the Hardy boys, to take on the Dudleys and William Regal, and you guys won the opening match there. It was in Detroit, Michigan, so there you go. How about that? Right on. Sounds yeah. like a good match. Sounds like a darn good match. And yes. that was actually the night, too. The main event was the NWO, so uh, Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, and Hulk Hogan took on the Rock. And Steve Austin in a handicap match. So pretty uh pretty big time there for uh WWE going on. Yeah, a lot of big star stuff happening on there. So so there you go. Little moment in history for you there, Rob. So there we go. Hmm. Yeah, see, Seth says IQ tests are hundred percent reasoning and problem solving. Uh, I wonder 
if he knows where you get it done, like what do you do? Can you get a, can you get a side IQ hookup? You go to a primary doctor and get a referral. How the fuck does that work? Yeah, I don't know. You work exactly. That's a good point. Jeez. I, I tried know. to look it up in the phone book, but I couldn't spell IQ. Mm, <laughs> dang it. I think it starts with a C. Mm. I don't know. Mm. Uh, I want to thank Layla. She's been chatting a lot in the, the chat, too, chiming in. And, Layla. Yeah. Layla. Hey, tying in the good fellas there. <laughs> you don't, you don't want to hear me, sir. That's all I do. <laughs> if you had to do karaoke, Rob, one yeah. song you had to pick, what would it be? Can't imagine having to do it anyway. Yeah, it's in some wild circumstances. Yeah. Do karaoke. <laughs> I remember when I was like uh, 23 years old, 24 years old in Japan, um, and sometimes they'd hand the microphone to me when it's going around. And I'd feel the pressure, and um, and it was like um, Bobby Duncan Jr. used to like doing. Um, on a sing horse I ride Bon Jovi. Oh yeah, Bon Jovi. Dead or Dead Alive. Dead or Alive. Wanted Dead or Alive. Bobby used to love singing that song. And um I remember when sometimes they would hand it to me. Dude, this was probably the same time that I went skydiving because uh, same breakup, same girl. But I remember when I'd get the, the microphone, I would change all the words, you know, and say, She's such a whore. What was I doing? should have known i shouldn't have been screwing her you know i was just like trying to make people laugh and, and yeah. <laughs> but, but i've never that's never been me i don't i don't know isn't that weird like they want to like i don't know i always get on this where music is just a thing why is it everything it's so everything that people want to sing other people's songs that people are getting paid to sing but I got asked yesterday some, on an interview about my song, my favorite song or, or my go-to or whatever. Yeah. And, I was, and I was saying, man, do you ever think about like you wake up to music on an alarm and you listen to music when you get ready and you listen to it on, in, in the car on the way. And if you, you listen and it's like, if you watch TV or you say, Hey, I want to choose a different art form. That's not music. I want to watch reality tv okay but then you're going to get music at the opening music on the commercial jingles music up to uh, uh trans um trans uh not translate what's the word uh to trans not transfer translate transfer transit thank you yeah, you're welcome. i'm stuck anyway um I was just explaining. I find it crazy that everyone subscribes their whole spirits and souls to music all day long. It's music, music everywhere. And so um, anyway, I just thought I'd bring that up because I was saying that yesterday. And he seemed to understand me. I'm like, I don't expect everyone to agree with me, but it's weird. And it's like, um, to me, going and doing karaoke with other people is like, That'd be about as fun for me as I guess mud wrestling in a bikini, mm -hmm. you know, like yeah. that's okay. It's okay for girls, but not me. Yeah. <laughs> I know some people, I, if I get enough booze in me, I will do karaoke. But, but but do you get do you understand what I'm saying about like music is is isn't everything. Let's say it's an art form. Yeah. Pick any pick any other art form. How can you get there without music? You can't. It's part of every other art form too. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, I, no, I don't want to listen to music. I want to watch wrestling. Okay, but obviously there's music, 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 music while you're sitting down, music while they come out, music, music. And uh, and it's just like it's so big and it's so everywhere. And people – and you, you have to – you don't have to admit, but I think you'll admit that, it, that music – at least partially dissipates your focus. 100%. Whether you're tapping your foot to a – thank you. Mm -hmm. it could be Maybe you're singing words to a song that you heard earlier, but boom, that's where part of your thoughts and brain are. So when people listen to music, it's like they want to be plugged in to cruise control and let the music take them. And, and, I can't, and for me, it, that feels anti-counterproductive to what I want – out of the day to be plugged in and going through cruise control all fucking day. That's just, that's just how I feel. I mean, I um, think that makes, I agree. I think that makes me weird because I know most people probably don't feel that way, but it's just a thing. It's a thing when we're in the car uh, and the, I, I will mostly have the, 
radio off. If Katie's in the car with me, I'll call it what it is. I'll be like, do you want to listen to people sing and play musical instruments? <laughs> Just literally say it. What it is, right? Yeah. Well, but you're right though, Rob, because honestly, like when I, I listen to music all the time and like, if I go to the gym, I'll have music, I'll have headphones in, or, you know, if I'm doing something, I'll walk into Starbucks, I'll have headphones in music, music, music. And it is, it's a way to go to the music and almost like a distraction cruise control. I think that's a great way to put it is cruise control. It takes you away from maybe certain elements or puts you in a different mindset of what you want to be, you know, in a certain way. So, you're not you're not learning anything new, right? Unless it's a new song or something. No, I'm connected. I'm I feel connected maybe with a song and feel maybe I feel positive inspiration or something to get it some or something. And I do that sometimes because I feel energy. So like like my ring music, Pantera or one of a kind, you know, or or fucking um, you know, a little higher. I fucking love that song. It makes me happy, it raises my spirit. So I feel the energy and shit, but it's such a small part uh, of my chosen day. Like I never, I don't like to go to concerts mm -hmm. um, and, and I wouldn't, I haven't bought a CD since I was probably fucking 18 or something. And uh, it's just, um, it's one of those things, you know, that sets me apart. So I think too, it, it's almost another level when you can, when you're able to do stuff like in silence, like you live with your own thoughts, you live with your own mind and what you what you bring to it. So if you're working out or whatever you're doing, if you're just working out in silence, I think that's, I tip my cap to people all the time that are able to do that. You know, I think that's pretty darn cool because it's tough to kind of get yourself motivated or whatever you need to do sometimes with that stuff, so. One thing that I'll hate, and I'll say this, since Katie's not in the room, <laughs> It's like if I go to if she's like singing to the radio or something, and like I'm trying to talk to her, and uh, she's got to finish, she's got to finish the lyrics to that paragraph first or whatever before she can pay attention. Even though it's something she's been listening to for ten years or whatever, you know. And I'll be like, uh, you know, did, what time do you gotta go to such and such? And she'll be like, it will be on your back, and you don't know that's whack. What? Yeah. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Just forget it. We'll talk later. We'll talk later. <laughs> Speaking of Seth, he chimes in again. Thank you, Seth, for the ten. Yeah, 10 man, we're spend, yeah. You know, I'm a fucking uh, ten nine nine ten. Uh, here. How about it, huh? You can be very high IQ, but without knowledge, wisdom, and discipline, you'll still be a fool. Humility is the best indicator of overall intelligence because it requires all three. Wow! wow. Ooh, yeah. you gave us like a riddler, a fucking uh, riddle or something, huh? Yeah. yeah. Well, I want to know how you get it tested, though. That's really, you know, like, I don't know if someone could just put it in the chat room or something, but I really don't know. And I've Googled it, and and, I, and you can pay to do it online. But I, I just feel funny, like, if I was, like, telling, bragging to people, like, dude, I scored a fucking whatever. And they were like, oh, yeah, where'd you get it done? I was like, online? Yeah, paid nine ninety nine online. On the internet? <laughs> that is legit. <laughs> I don't know. I printed out the certificate. Right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, well, and they cool. should do that in college or something, maybe, right? They should. Yeah, I bet you there's got to be a way where you can get like a good one. Would you go out of your way to go and actually take it like at a physical yeah. place or something? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. We should figure Probably out. Probably be better somewhere else than home, just like if I'm writing or something, you know, it's hard to do when I'm in my comfort zone. Right, right. No. That'd be, I, I'd definitely be interested in seeing that. I bet you would do good on it, Rob. Uh, this is not a super chat, but this is a cool one. Anybody Don that wants to bet against, we can take those wagers too. That'd be fun. We'll take some wagers. Put them in the super chat. <laughs> wait, wait, wait your amount. Bears Bound 80809 says, Dom, out of all the podcasts there are, you truly have the greatest spot being the host of Rob's. This is seriously the most informative podcast in wrestling and life in general. General. General, grateful for Jennifer. Yeah. Jennifer. Awesome. Sweet. Right on. Very cool. Yeah, good stuff. There's another good one. Cool. Yeah. Fucking um, yeah, and that's uh that's good. I guess that's who uh I guess that's who'll stick around is people that like hearing uh life advice and stories and uh you know everything that we bring. 
It's like, uh, for those who are interested, we do it a little different here, right? We do. We cook things up a little differently around here. We have a different recipe. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. Uh, Rob, did you have an RVDology? You want to just wait till next week? We can do that. Whatever we're well, doing. let's go. Let's do some of these plugs that we keep forgetting about. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's right. Jeez, oh, man. Thanks for reminding me, actually. Okay. Yeah, you, Rob, so you sent me this last week. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, okay, yeah. So this is uh, my friend that um, uh, he's my friend from Amsterdam, and he wrote this book on the whole effing couple, RVD and uh, – and Katie Forbes. And um, is that all I sent you was that? You sent Not me for, for the book itself, I believe. Okay, because there's a link to order it. Oh, yeah. you sent me the link. What I will do is I'll put it, I'll screenshot it on there. So when, when people can see it. And I'll link it in this week's episode too. Okay, cool. Yeah, whatever we can whatever we can do to help them out. I haven't read it. Um, so, you know, let me know if you get a chance to read it. Uh, I'm learning just right now like i was this many years old when i really started to understand artificial intelligence oh yeah i think most likely that that was what he used in this book because you know he's not an expert on rob van dam and katie forbes you know but there's just thumbing through it there's a lot of stuff in there and it wouldn't have come from his firsthand knowledge um but he did do an interview with me and an interview with her and then put that together with this book but man i had another friend well joe joe clark we did headstrong together the, yeah. uh, and he's been on the show he's been on the show yeah so we've talked about some ideas like a reality show with me and Katie. We talked about some ideas and then he sent me this huge email and he said he ran this stuff through uh, AI and came up with this pitch. I had no idea what he was talking about. Like, I just didn't know, yeah. you know, and now I'm starting to understand because I was playing around with it a little bit and, and I had no idea this thing, this AI actually has reasonability and, thinks and makes and has decision making power and, and and i had no idea i thought it was reaching and just bringing me articles that it could find online i didn't know it was rewording them and talking about those articles in a in a in another perspective that didn't even exist until we started this conversation and it just it's like it's like blowing my mind i can't wait to learn more about it especially how i can learn to use it to help me in my life somehow Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's wild. Yeah. I'll see stuff. People you'll see like descriptions or something or YouTube descriptions or whatever it may be certain things or even like artwork or whatever. And like people input this stuff in the AI and then it produces something. Sometimes I know I've seen on your Twitter, Rob, sometimes people do AI art of you and stuff like that. I've seen and stuff. So I well, I, I have seen like some mafia videos and I didn't understand the whole thing, but I knew that it was AI doing the narration mm -hmm. because one, the voice sounds robotic with the speech patterns. And also it would be a little repetitive and it would mispronounce names, you know? Um, and, and I knew, and I didn't like, because it was repetitive you know, it was too much. A lot of those are, yeah. but I didn't realize how they were being put together and, and, and what people were, we're using, which I guess is an app or whatever. And then saying, Hey, fucking do all this work and tell the story. We want to talk about, uh, Al Capone in the 1920s and tell us everything you could. And it, I mean, it reasons. And I, I know I'm the last one. So everyone listening already understands it and stuff, but I'm fascinated with it. And I've had a couple of people tell me that they use it. And I'm like, I got to use it. I don't know how yet, but I didn't get it. I had, I did not get it. Now I want to watch every movie on AI, <laughs> including that Will Smith one. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it. I don't know. Now I want to. I'll go back and watch it. <laughs> I just think of Terminator, you know, when it's like yeah. us, the robots. Because I have seen the robots that, that move like humans, you know, whether they're dancing or doing flips or anything. And that's crazy. But combining that with the um the intellectuality the the uh, i want to say the robot brain but it's i don't even think it exists when i think a robot i think of like physical steel yeah right 
yeah, this just seems to be like an intelligence and an ability to grow and adapt to to to, to learning more. And and of course, it's scary, just like fucking Terminator with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Right. It's like, and but it's like this invisible being. Like it's like, okay, you input all this stuff. There's so many elements that you can put into it. When's it going to become too much, and it's going to like just take over the the human race? Yeah, mm. I, I you know I, I feel like everyone probably is way ahead of me on this but you know if not if anyone else is hearing this and they're shocked you gotta look into it <laughs> rob I'm, I'm behind on it like i barely use it i don't even know how to input stuff on there i never do the graphic stuff i never do anything with ai really and so i'm like i'm intimidated by it. i'm like i don't know i'm not i'm not messing with it right now <laughs> I, was, I was like talking to that chat gpt i think it's called yeah um jennifer was showing me and i kept asking more questions and it wasn't stuff that was reported it was like you got to do some homework and find out for me you know yeah i was like um i said did uh did marshall caifano and johnny roselli cross paths in a timeline in las vegas and then i went through and it was saying, you know, that uh, this, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, can you elaborate on that and say specifically, like, what reports are, you know, chronologically listed when Marshall Caifano was here and what reports listed when John Erzell was here? And, man, it was like talking to a person. It wasn't just spitting the facts back, like it was finding an article and giving it to me. It was reasoning with me and saying, you know, it's it's – you know, it, it's hard to conclude that they were for sure, although it's likely at some time that their paths would have crossed since they were both there, you know, in the 50s and the early 60s. And it was like, I was just like, I'm talking to <laughs> a robot. <laughs> I'm baffled. I'm baffled too, Rob. Yeah. It's wild stuff. Wild stuff. Uh, the other thing you wanted to cover last week, which is a really cool thing, um, and he actually showed up at Sting's last match, Scotty Riggs. Bam! Look at my yeah. brother, Scotty. Holy yeah. How was that? So yeah, that was that was like six months, which is a really really quick uh, dramatic change, you know. And he's uh, working with DDP. Scotty was living in his truck. You know, I was keeping in touch with him, man. He's a proud dude. Yeah. He was like, I don't want you to send me no money. Like, what if I just call and get a hotel and just go stay there just for the night, you know, and get warm or something? He's like, I'm not, I don't want that from you. I'm, I'm fine, you know, as long as you're still there for me or whatever. Of course, you know, uh, now uh, he's in a total different position. And, uh, man, there's a video that uh, we got this from. This was the thumbnail from it. Damn, what is the video called? I can't tell anyone how to look for it now. I think it's called No Let me just Scotty Riggs. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Maybe that's what it's called. But it's Novia is the, the denture place. And he had like no teeth. And they gave him teeth and then showed him his smile. And it was like it was, the whole episode was so inspirational. I was smiling from ear to ear watching it. And it was just like it was so cool to see him get into shape and get confident. And according to Katie, he's a handsome dude, too. I look at him, and I, I think, you know, he looks successful. I would think that that guy is a uh, entrepreneur of some kind of business. You know, I don't know what he does, but if I didn't know him. Yeah. So, um, that's, yeah, definitely worth mentioning. He was, he told me he was going to be on camera during Sting's retirement, match. So, I guess, uh, hopefully they showed him. He was, he was there. We, they saw, they showed him. They talked, they mentioned him, too, on air, too. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. He was sitting ringside with Magnum TA, uh, Lex Luger. Well, no, was Lex Luger there? Magnum TA and somebody else. Oh, Nikita Koloff was there too, and then Scotty Riggs was ringside. So cool, pretty darn cool, pretty darn cool. And the video, guys, if you do want to check it out, go to on YouTube. The transformation of Scotty Riggs. Type that in. It's part two. And yeah, you, part, that's right. And Rob, you said too, it's Novia Dental Impact Implant Center. So what an inspirational video, man! It's like nine minutes. And I was watching that, and I was, it just made me happy watching that. I was like, man, I got to remember to mention that on the show to people that want to want to, want to bring your energy up. Watch that. It's a really inspirational video. Scotty's a good guy. Uh, you know, he's proud. And uh, as you see, he was shown that um, it's never too late. 
never too late to be moving in the right direction. 100%, Rob. Hey, yeah. this episode moved in the right direction, Rob. It was a lot of fun. We covered a lot of ground. and uh, got This weekend. Of- wait, when does this? Because it's not Friday, right? That's right. Yes. Yeah. So, Rob, you have a little something going on this weekend. March 9th. I'm in Chillicothe, Ohio. First ever match uh, between RVD and Matt Riddle. Bro, wow. Yes, How about sir. that? And uh, that is uh, Saturday in uh, Chillicothe, March 9th. March 10th, I'm in Clay, New York, which is right outside of Syracuse. Mm. And uh, I am appearing at the uh, Ravens. Ravens. What is it? Ravens Joint. Ravens Joint. Yeah, Ravens Ravens Joint is uh, having their grand opening this weekend. It's a uh, marijuana dispensary. It's going to be a huge deal. You can uh, you can find the details and information for RVD's appearance at meetrvd.com. They went all out for this appearance. Um, and this is I haven't looked to see if this is on meetrvd.com. It probably is. But the guy told me since it's a uh, dispensary, and kids aren't going to be coming to meet RVD there. He asked me if I could stop by this other place too, where the kids can see me. Um, and so I'm doing another appearance there uh, afterwards, I suppose. And so you might want to look at meetrvd.com and see if information is on there. If you've got some chillins or if you're not an adult and uh, that way you don't miss out. I'm seeing the whole laughing show, yo, bro. Rob, I think it's Market Fair North, it might be, is what uh, maybe it says. It says, meet Rob Van Dam, WD Hall of Famer, world-renowned yep. professional wrestler who gained widespread acclaim and high-flying martial arts influence wrestling style. Market Fair North in Clay, New York. So take a look. Yes, go to meetrvd.com. They have uh, the event information and uh, the photo opportunities and all that stuff. So if you... You have some kids. Maybe you can bring them and check them out and meet Mr. Monday night, Mr. Wednesday night, Mr. Every Ooh. damn day of the week. So there you go. How about that? Um, oh, we got another super chat that chimed in here. Na- Naval Nation, too. Thanks for the five pounds. How long you in AAW for? Are you part-time co- contract or when they need you like an, an agency? Robbie, you're set up basically when Tony calls you, right? Basically. Basically, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not him that, that personally calls me. I mean, he has, it has you know, we it started that way. Um, and now I talk to, um, um, I guess you guys probably do want to know. I was going to say you guys probably don't care, but you probably do care. Um, Sanjay. Oh, okay. Sanjay. Nice. nice. And uh, he'll text me and say, uh, hey, RVD, can you, can you work, you know, next Saturday, March 15th in, um, or, or sometimes it'll say where, or else he won't say where he'll just, sometimes it'll say where, otherwise, you know, can you work uh, next, you know, next Wednesday, March 20th or whatever. And then look, I sure can dude. And then we do it and that's it. That's it. You know, this, uh, current booking that I have on the table for 420 is the second most time that I've been allotted, um, for a match after it's booked, you know, so I've had why well, five matches and then one booking that was just my first appearance with um, Jungle Boy, yeah. and um, so that one, that one was it. Seems like it was at least eight nine months in advance. That first one. Wow. wow. Every every other one has been like a week in advance. And then I got this 420 one coming up that they must have something special in mind because they reserved that, uh, I guess, a couple of months ahead of time. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, I don't, I don't have uh, any kind of a uh, long-term commitment with them. Just a great relationship. I love being an independent contractor. I am a uh, gun for hire. Bang bang. Um, <laughs> and, um, it works out great. I think for both parties, uh, hopefully for everybody at this point, damn good relationship, right? There. Oh, how about that? Cool. Um, Rob, anything else you want to mention before we, we end the show here? Um, no, I think, 
I think maybe we covered it all. We talked about the action figure. When is that coming out? Do you know? I'm not sure. I think um, I know it's not available to order yet. And I know, I think it's a Walmart exclusive if I read that correctly too, but um, such a cool figure. Uh, definitely keep your eyes peeled for that. And any information we'll get, we'll be sure to promote it on here. So, um, right. Yeah, man, we'll go do, we'll go take care of the weekend, uh, knock out uh, Ohio and then go straight up to New York. A little bit of, uh, a little bit of travel, um, but we'll suck it up. We'll get it done. We'll meet a bunch of fans. It'll be awesome. And then uh, we'll come right back here next week. Next week here on One of a Kind with RVD. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, everybody, for tuning yeah, in. Thanks, Tom. Uh, Yepper, you thanks know it. Thanks, Van Dam fam. Ooh, See you next week. See you next week.